have your Bibles, grab them. Uh, we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 6 today, and we are going over what I believe is a very, very relevant topic, but also one that is going to be really hard to hear. And so in today's age and what we're going through, our hearts and our souls should be crying out to this, to be saying, no, this is the truth and this is right. But our ears and our mind and, and that part of our hearts that are wayward and evil and, and, and always seems to go in the other direction than God, those are going to be the things that are also screaming and saying, no, this isn't right. Don't listen to this. And so uh, the scriptures are going to be a good beacon and a good light and ways to navigate through it. So um, in your Bible, read along with me. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter six. And this is a story that a lot of us have heard before, but I'm hoping that we take a little bit of a different approach to it and let the scriptures read us today. And so uh, I just I just want to I just want to jump right in here. So Isaiah chapter six, verse one uh, through two says this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his road filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two that covered his face, two that covered his feet, and with two he flew. And so, uh, right away, I, I want to I want to do our best to put use our imaginations and put our kind of ourselves in this text. It says, "In the year that King Uzziah died," and and that's how uh, Isaiah starts this vision. He lets us know the context of it. It's the year that King Uzziah died, and historians uh, generally agree on that he died uh, somewhere around. Uh, the time of 740 BC. And so uh, this is 740 years ish before uh, Jesus, but uh, history will tell us that King Uzziah had a long reign, that he, he was a king for a long time and he has just died. Now, think to yourself, what would it be like if a king that has has been has been in in I was gonna say office, but has has been ruling the kingdom for a long time died? Well, you got to know there's probably some uncertainty, some doubt, some nervousness. And uh, this is where I believe that we can relate because we find ourselves right now in today's uh, climate. We find ourselves worrying about all sorts of things. We have the Russia and Ukraine thing going on. And uh, is that going to escalate? Or is, uh, what's going on there? And so I, I, I just talking to a lot of us. Uh, that is something that is on the forefront of our mind and not just that but along comes with that the possibility of a famine or a food uh, shortage for the world and there's all these things that we can spiral into and on top of all that then you have talks about recession and, and I don't know if you're like me but uh, you're at the gas pump and you just fill up your car and you look at it and you think to yourself you're you're like I've I've got to get a bike right like I I don't know how much longer that I can do this. And so today we find ourselves probably like the people in Isaiah's time, very uneasy. There's a lot of uh, apprehension and a lot of nervousness. And so uh, he starts off with saying, this is when that happened. But then I, I, want, I want you to see the very next words after that. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. And so wherever we're at today, wherever this message finds us, we can come in with nervousness, but immediately Isaiah says that his focus shifted and it focused uh, from maybe the uneasiness to the Lord. And, and also not just to the Lord, there's, there's something else with the Lord, and that's a seraphim, and, which is a marvelous creature. And we could spend a long time talking about that, but we need to move on. But uh, what, what is definitely happening here is Isaiah is probably getting his breath taken away a little bit. And, and I'll show you what I mean. So let's keep reading. Let's, uh, let's go into verse 3 and verse 4. So verse 3, and one called to another. So one seraphim called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook and the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. Man, what a scene. The 
the foundation is shaking. There's there's smoke going out. These creatures, though, and all this that is going on are focused on two things. And this is this is going to be a repeating pattern for us today. They're focused on the Lord. Look what it says. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So what are they're focused on the Lord, but they're also focused on his his holiness. And then they're focused on the second part. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, all of this is happening around him. And have you ever had a moment in your life, like maybe you've seen the Grand Canyon or you've seen something that is just marvelous and it kind of takes your breath away and anything that you were thinking about beforehand no longer is relevant. You're only there in the moment focusing on what's in front of you. And that has had to happen to Isaiah. He came in with maybe some uneasiness and now he's focused on the Lord and all the stuff that is going on, the smoke like a Michael Bay film, everything is shaking. And then look what Isaiah responds with verse five and i said woe is me for i am lost for i am a man of unclean lips and i dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts and immediately look at the language and look at the look at the focus and the the message that Isaiah is speaking about when uh, he lays eyes on the Lord. He immediately immediately says, "Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips." And and he goes further and says, "I live among a people with unclean lips." And the, and the first major pillar of what we're going to be talking about today is anytime you come face to face with the Lord, there is a piece of you that is exposed because he is holy and we are not. And there's no hiding from that. Make no mistake. There is absolutely zero hiding. Uh, when you compare yourself, your sin, your depravity to the Lord. And, and but but here's the thing that I just want to caution us as, as as we're wading through this we as Christians we like to not do that and that's why this is a message that is that is hard to hear because we like instead of focusing on the Lord we like to play this comparison game so when it comes to our sin and our heart issue instead of going to the Lord and let uh, those being exposed we like to compare ourselves to the uh, one of two places. Uh, the first one being we like to compare ourselves to the people around us. And so that might be that might be uh, somebody uh, who you look at and you're like, man, at least I'm I'm not going through that. I am I'm past that point. Um, I see this a lot. Like <laughs> right now, this is Pride Month, and so instead of Instead of us going to the Lord and letting the Lord just deal with our own sin, I've heard a lot of Christians in our talk, uh, instead of instead of just uh, calling it for what it is and saying, this is what the Lord feels about this, that we almost take this entitled, like, I can't believe this is going on, and look at my life, and I could never, I could never be walking through this, and we compare ourselves to this group of people, and we say to ourselves, at least we're not them. And church, that's a very, very dangerous place to be is when you're deflecting your own sin, comparing yourself to another person. It's outright dangerous and hurtful to our souls when we take this position. And it might not even be with another person. Maybe it's to yourself. Maybe the Lord has brought you out of something. Maybe maybe he's delivered you from an addiction or for, from relationships that are harmful or whatever it is. Maybe he's given you victory in these areas. And so you'll compare yourself to who you were. And you think to yourself, I'm not that person anymore. So today I am good. And man, the Bible and all throughout scripture is going to say we need to be careful when we say that when we are comparing ourselves to anyone else but the lord we need to be careful yet man our our flesh and our our everything about us would say no 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 no. look at them you're not them. you're doing good careful church and the 
The second way we play this comparison game is maybe you compare yourself to where you want to be in somebody, uh, in somebody else. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's a mentor. Maybe it's someone that you think is further along in your walk. And instead of comparing yourself with the Lord, you'll compare yourself to that person so that you can get there. But let me tell you that there is no human being on the face of this earth that can carry the weight in which was meant for the Lord. Then, because uh, what happens when that person lets you down, when, when their own sin gets in the way, and all of a sudden, I've seen this, man, just the walls crumble about all this faith somebody put in this person, and they don't know it, but they're comparing their own um, morality to this person's morality, and that is wrong, and we need to be what Isaiah is doing now. We need to compare ourselves to no other person. Uh, being but the Lord and his son Jesus Christ and if we can if we can do that we can and we can move on from here I, I want to show you what uh, happens Isaiah when he s comes face to face with the Lord look what look what the language look what look what he says he says for I am lost and I am a man of unclean lips but then I I love what happens. Isaiah doesn't stay here, neither should we. So let's let's go to verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand a burning coal that had been taken with tong tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Man, there's something amazing going on. Because Isaiah confessed he's a man of unclean what? Lips. And what did this coal touch? His lips. So where are we today? What are we walking in here with? Uh, I am a man or a woman of unclean blank. Man, I don't even have to ask you what that is. Your spirit knows it. Take a minute. Maybe, maybe ask, I am a man or a woman of unclean. What is it, Lord? And, and, and I, am, I am willing uh, to, to think that, that whatever that is is popping up immediately. If you're honest and, 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 and you're open. I am a man of unclean blank. What is that blank? And I love what goes on here because it needs to be noticed uh, or noted that the coal itself is not what cleansed uh, Isaiah, but it's the Lord. And the, the Lord is saying, you think you're a man of unclean lips? Look what I'm going to do. I am going to forgive your guilt in this area and I am going to atone for your sins in this area because we cannot move on as believers in Jesus Christ if we don't plant our flag here and know that if you are a believer that Jesus is the son of God and you are his that your sins one the guilt of them are gone so whatever you're holding in your blank the guilt from that should be gone through the blood of Jesus Christ and it has been atoned for. It has been paid for. And all of this is going on and swirling around us. And if we're going to go further into what the Lord has for us, because it's more than just this, then we have got to know that our guilt and our price of our sin for anyone who believes in Jesus is dealt with. And if that isn't you today, we can't go further. You need to know that if you put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, this too applies to you. So why? Why do we need to go further? Because we will not get what comes next. Look, in verse 6. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And uh, church, we, we hear this a lot. We hear this a lot about who will answer the call of the Lord. And, and it's kind of almost like one of those motivational posters that we as Christians, we always go back to this verse and we're like, send me, send me. But we cannot move forward unless we know one, that we compare ourselves to the Lord and the Lord only and let him deal with the sin that he will uncover like the lord uncovers our sinful hearts 
and and we can't step into the work and the purpose that he has for my life and your life unless we know this and if we move on and uh here's a here's the thing now, i believe a lot of believers we're in this we're in this place where we at least we want to be obedient and we want to be used by the lord and this message is is going to kind of give us this a little guideline and okay this is this is what it should look like and it it comes in three parts we've already gone over the first two compare yourself to the lord and the lord only know that you're uh if you confess that jesus is lord that your sin is 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 forgiven and that the guilt is removed and then this third part is send me what what is that going to even look like if it's if it's really with the lord and it's going to be different than most of us think scriptures is is very clear about what this is going to look like because your reward for saying send me and being obedient is obedience that's your reward what what that that's that that's what i'm gonna get if 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 i'm like send me i'll go i'm be obedient my reward is that obedience and i'm gonna say yes because when you're obedient to the lord in the right way the outcome is always always 24 7 365 days a week every time when you're obedient the correct way what comes up next is what the seraphims were also focusing on is god's glory you can't separate these two when you're obedient the way the right way with the lord then god's glory he will receive that glory those two go hand in hand and that's it that is it as far as rewards and let me tell you that is such a good good thing and, and, and scripture is full of this. And so like Matthew chapter six, verse five, it says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners and that they may be seen by others. And truly I say to you, they have received their reward. And so when we're walking out this Christian life and, and what it should look like, I, I just want to say that it is not like, man, things are going to prosper all around me. Where have we got this twisted? Like, like there's so many churches today that are preaching a false gospel of Jesus that when you follow him, everything around you will prosper. And I don't find that anywhere in the scriptures. I see that if you're obedient, God will get the glory. And that's, that's the good news. That is a thing that should be in every Christian's heartbeat. God, for you be the glory. Let us make ourselves low for your glory is what I care about. Yet we have perverted the gospel with everything will prosper and we see this on isaiah and isaiah the lord said you're gonna go and people are gonna listen to you but none of them are gonna hear you and 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 is your ministry gonna explode or all these people gonna come to know me no but you're gonna be obedient and i'm gonna get the glory or in this in this uh text in matthew when you when you pray don't be like those who pray in front of others for their that's the reward they're going to get. But the Bible is, is constantly talking about there's, there's something more. There's something more. In church, as, as, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks, we've seen, we've seen uh, just, just two weeks ago, we saw 15 people get their life to the Lord and, become, or, and get baptized. And that, that is so good. And then last week, we, we had our service weekend, and we... Uh, we did physical acts around our our town, and those two things are the culmination of of a lot of soul work that the that we've we've been pouring out into these people or physical work. And at the end of that, it can leave you weary. But church, do not grow weary, but press on because. Uh, scriptures will say that there there's a reward that is guaranteed for every believer who is obedient and i just i just want to uh read this with you and so uh let's as we close let's look at matthew chapter 25 verse 31 i want you to read this with me so pause it and get there matthew chapter 25 verse 31 it says this 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are, who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And before, before we see the pearly gates or the streets of gold, before we get to see any reward in heaven, we get to hear this, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you. We are not guaranteed tangible things on this earth, but what we are going to receive is, well done, my good and faithful servant. You were obedient. And to most people, that sounds like, what? What are you doing it? But for those that have the spirit of the Lord living in them, that is such a thing to look forward to that produces joy and perseverance and can overcome the weariness we might find ourselves in today when the Lord is going to say, well done, son or daughter. So that's, that's it. Focus on the Lord and the Lord only focus on him then be obedient once you know that your guilt is forgiven and your sin is forgiven and three when you go expect that your reward is your obedience and God's glory and that's what the Lord has to share through us from Isaiah chapter 6 and so um, if you find yourself today and this this spoke to you and you're like Lord what do I need to be obedient in in my life like he won't be it won't be a confusing thing but when you seek him, he will tell you. And then he'll ask you to do it. And a lot of times it's in really, really small things. Really small things. Like we're like, obedience is going to look like moving to be a missionary in Africa when the Lord is like, no, I'm just asking you to speak to your son or daughter. And you might get angry, but to listen to them. I want you to do that for me. Even if they're disrespectful for you or to you. Or I want you to, to make amends with a neighbor who has never said they're sorry. Or, or maybe forgive someone who did something to you and they don't even deserve it, but I want you to forgive them in your heart. See, the Lord is going to lead his people into obedience so that he receives the glory. And as long as we're a church that makes that our focus, that we focus on our own sin and let the Lord deal with our own sin so we don't become puffed up and hypocrites and we do things for his glory, there are such good things that await us. Awesome. Let's pray. Lord, I just, I thank you for the reading of your word today. Lord, I just, Father, I pray that anything that I said uh, that was false today falls away, but that your truth remains, Father, that your truth is, is the thing that is planted in our hearts, Lord. So uh, as we go on from here, Father, I pray you lead us into the things that we can be obedient in. Lord, may we deal with those dark places of your heart and let you, and just give them to you and ultimately let you be the one who deals with them. And Father, may we, may we be a people who are, are obedient for your glory. And Lord, we thank you for your Son, who without this, none of this is possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.